Hi everyone, welcome back to our coverage of the cardiovascular system. This is the third lecture in our cardiovascular unit where we're actually covering three chapters in total. We're covering uh, chapter 18 looking at the heart, chapter 19 looking at the vessels, and we briefly talked about chapter 20 and the lymphatic system. Today we're going to be focusing on chapter 19 uh, or I'm sorry, chapter 18, where we're looking at the heart itself. We're going to be learning heart anatomy in today's lecture, and in our next lecture, we're going to be looking at the path of blood. Following that, we will start to look at how does the heart function leading into blood pressure eventually. So, as always, let's go ahead and get started with our not really attendance questions. First, what do arteries do? And second, which vessel type has the lowest pressure? So go ahead and answer those. Okay, hopefully you've done that. And this first question, what do arteries do? Remember I told you that will be on every single exam going forward. So you should be able to answer that with no problem at all. But arteries carry blood away from the heart and that's that's it that's all they do sometimes they carry oxygenated blood sometimes they carry deoxygenated blood depending on which arteries they are but all arteries carry blood away from the heart next which vessel type has the lowest pressure here the further we get away from the heart the lower the pressure is. So the vessel type with the lowest pressure is a vein. And we will be looking at uh, that in a little more detail today and then a lot in the next lecture. So let's talk about the heart. The heart is right in the middle of the chest. It is not on the left side of the chest the way a lot of people think. It is right in the middle of the chest. It's about the size of your closed fist, maybe just a little bit bigger, but as a general rule, it's about the size of your closed fist. And it weighs typically less than a pound. It's not a very large organ for how important it is. It sits right in the middle of the chest, like we said, between your lungs. We don't see them in this image, but there's a lung on each side of the heart. It sits right below the throat. And here is that uh, cavity that we mentioned, but we didn't really talk a whole lot about in Bio 137, the mediastinum or the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is where the heart is found. That's the cavity where the heart is found. And about two thirds of the mass of the heart is on the left side of the chest. The left side of the heart is thicker so it has more mass and that is why we often feel the heart on the left side of the chest and think that the heart sits on the left side of the chest it's because the left side of the heart is bigger and more massive than the right side of the heart and the heart kind of curves it's a little bit difficult to see in this image but it kind of curves and comes to a point at the bottom and that point is called the apex. And that apex points roughly towards the left hip. So here is the heart. It is a hollow muscular organ. If we cut it open, there are chambers inside, so it is hollow. It's filled with blood and the walls are quite muscular. The top chambers in the heart, which we'll learn about later, these are called the atria. There's a left and a right atrium, and the bottom are the ventricles. There's a left and a right ventricle, and they are surrounded by muscle. Now the atria, the top parts, they're not really involved with pumping blood. They do contract just a little bit, but they don't play a role in pumping blood around the body. So they're pretty thin. 
The ventricles are what do the pumping of blood, so their walls are really thick. But the features are going to be the same as far as what we're about to talk about, and that's the walls of the heart. So here we've taken just a little bit of the top chamber, so that is an atrium. Remember anatomical position, we are facing the person, so over here, this is the left. So we're looking at a bit of the wall of the left atrium. Now, if we looked at the right atrium, it would look the same. If we looked at the ventricles, it would look the same. The only difference really is the thickness of this muscular layer. So we are taking this, the wall of the left atrium, and blowing it up so that we could see it in a lot more detail. To orient yourself, what we're seeing here, this bottom part of this image is inside the heart. Since we're looking at the left atrium here, this is the left atrium. There would be blood inside of this. But all of this is the wall of the heart. Now, working our way from the outside in, everything up here is outside the heart. So right here is, think back to Bio 137 when we were learning about the organs in the thoracic cavity, the chest, and the abdominal cavity. We learned about those membranes that surround those organs. They were called serous membranes. And the serous membranes were, we could say they're a single layer or we could say they're a double layer and what I mean by that is it is a single membrane one layer but it is folded back on itself to produce two layers there are two layers to the membrane but they are essentially the same layer if that is a little tricky go back to chapter one and read about the serous membranes because that's what we're talking about here and when we look at those serous membranes, we gave them special names depending on where they were found and what organs they were covering. Around the heart, it was called the pericardium. Pericardium. And since there are two layers, one layer sits directly on the surface of the organ that it's surrounding. That is called the visceral layer. Viscera, remember, means organs internal organs. So the visceral layer sets on the surface of whatever organ it's covering. The other, as we fold back, the outer layer was called the parietal layer. Since we're talking about the heart, the layer that sits directly on the surface of the heart is called the visceral pericardium. The visceral pericardium. And when we fold back, this would be the parietal pericardium. In between is the pericardial cavity. We'll talk about that cavity in just a moment. But we fold back, so here we have the parietal pericardium. But around the heart, we can see that the parietal pericardium actually has two layers itself, but they are made of different substances. The inner of those two parietal pericardia layers, this is a serous membrane. It's very moist, it's very soft, it doesn't really offer a whole lot of protection. But on the outside, this layer is thicker. It's got a lot of collagen fibers. It's very tough. So the outside of the outer layer is the fibrous pericardium. Fibrous because of all those collagen fibers. It's very tough. It's very protective. So the fibrous pericardium. The inner layer of the pericardium, the, the, well, the inner layer of the parietal pericardium is serous. So we have the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. 
and the serous pericardium has the parietal layer and the visceral layer. So really, these are all the outside layer, but there are three of them. And in between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous part of the pericardium, we have the pericardial cavity filled with pericardial fluid. And the pericardial fluid acts as a lubricant. So think about what the heart's doing. It's constantly beating. It contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes. And when that happens, these two layers of the pericardium are going to be rubbing against each other. But that fluid acts as a lubricant to prevent them from rubbing against each other and irritating each other. There is a situation where there's not enough pericardial fluid. When that happens, these two layers do rub against each other and they irritate each other and it causes intense crushing pain and it can feel like you're having a heart attack. But that situation is just because these layers are rubbing together, irritating and inflaming each other and that is called pericarditis. Pericarditis. Now down here we have the endocardium. That is the inner layer, the inner lining of the heart. The inner lining of the heart would be in contact with the blood. And it is just another membrane. It is simple squamous epithelium. Sometimes that inner lining can get infected. And when it is infected or inflamed, it is called endocarditis. Endocarditis. And that is, it could happen from a few different reasons, but it's really common among intravenous drug users. If you are sharing dirty needles and you inject that needle into your bloodstream, well, now you've got bacteria in your bloodstream and that bacteria in your bloodstream at some point is going to pass through the inside of the heart. When that happens, some of those bacteria can stick against the endocardium, begin to multiply, infecting the endocardium, and that is endocarditis. Now, in a little while, we're going to learn about valves inside the heart. When we learn about them, know that valves are extensions of the endocardium. The endocardium can extend forward and produce a valve. So when we learn about valves in a moment, think back to endocardium. So we've seen the outside layers, we've seen the inside layer, but in between them, there is the actual muscular wall of the heart called the myocardium. And the myocardium is muscle. It is cardiac muscle. That is the part of the heart wall that actually does the contracting and relaxing to cause heartbeats. And like I said, around the atria, it's very thin. Around the ventricles, it's much thicker. So here we see the inside of the heart. And we're going to learn a lot of terms here. We're going to learn about the heart anatomy inside. But when we look at the heart, there is uh, some major vessels entering or exiting the heart. If we look at the surface of the heart, there's very small vessels all over the surface. But when we are talking about the vessels of the heart, really what we're talking about are these big vessels entering or exiting the heart. And collectively, we call these the great vessels. Then we have the chambers that we mentioned just a moment ago. On the superior surface or on the top surface of the heart, we have the atria. We have a right atrium and a left atrium. 
at the bottom, at the inferior surface of the heart, we have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. And then inside, we have valves. There are four valves inside the heart. There are muscular features and a few other features inside the heart. So we are going to learn all of those, beginning with the chambers. So I said up on the superior or top surface of the heart, we have atria. The right atrium and the left atrium. Both of the atria are receiving chambers. They receive blood. They sit on the top or superior surface of the heart. The right side, the right atrium, receives blood from the body. Blood that has been circulating through the entire body returns to the right atrium. Then it moves into the right ventricle. The ventricles eject blood. So the right ventricle ejects blood to the lungs. As the heart contracts, it pushes blood out of the right ventricle into this vessel we'll talk about in a moment, and that carries blood towards the lungs. Over here on the left side of the heart, we have the left atrium. The left atrium receives blood coming back to the heart from the lungs. Then it moves down into the left ventricle, and when the heart contracts and squeezes blood out. Blood is ejected from the left ventricle into this vessel which carries blood to the entire body. So the right side of the heart receives blood from the body and ejects it towards the lungs. The left side of the heart receives blood to the lung from the lungs and ejects it to the rest of the body. Those are the chambers. Now we're going to look at the great vessels, the vessels that are either entering or exiting the heart. Over on the right side of the heart, the right atrium, we said, is receiving blood from the body. So here we have something called the vena cava that is returning blood from the body into the right atrium. But the vena cava is actually two vessels. We have the superior vena cava, which returns blood from the upper part of the body. Basically, anything above the heart. The arms, the upper chest, and the head. That blood returns to the right side of the heart through the superior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is bringing blood from the body below the heart. It comes up and into the right atrium. So the right atrium is receiving blood from the superior and inferior vena cava. We said blood moves from the atrium into the ventricle, and then in the right ventricle, when it ejects blood, it's going towards the lungs. So we exit the right ventricle into this vessel called the pulmonary trunk. And when you have a real heart and you hold it so that you're facing it in anatomical position, right on top, in front, the first vessel is the pulmonary trunk. That's what we see right here. It is, the pulmonary trunk is an artery. So the pulmonary trunk exits the right ventricle and it immediately splits into two pulmonary arteries, one going towards the left lung, one going towards the right lung. So exiting the right ventricle, we go into the pulmonary trunk and then into the left and right pulmonary arteries. Now let's look at the left side of the heart. Up here in the left atrium, we said it's receiving blood from the lungs. So coming back from the lungs, we have pulmonary veins. 
we have right pulmonary veins coming back from the right lung, left pulmonary veins coming back from the left lung. All of them enter into the left atrium. Here we can see it pretty well just directly in. Over here on the right side, we see these two vessels, but really they are passing behind the heart. They are also entering into the left atrium. From the left atrium, blood flows down into the left ventricle. And we said the left ventricle ejects blood going towards the body. So we pass from the left ventricle into the largest vessel in the body called the aorta. The aorta leaves the left ventricle to carry blood towards the rest of the body. So those are the great vessels. Now let's go back inside the heart. There are four valves inside the heart. There are uh, two valves, one in between the atrium and the ventricle on each side of the heart. And there are two valves, one in between the ventricle and whichever artery is leaving it on each side of the heart. So first, let's look at the valves in between the atrium and the ventricle on each side of the heart. These are called the atrioventricular valves, usually abbreviated AV valves. On the right side of the heart, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, is the right atrioventricular valve, the right AV valve. When we look at it, it has three flaps. Those flaps are called cusps. And since there are three of them, we call the right AV valve the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve, the right AV valve, the right atrioventricular valve, all of those are the same thing. Right side of the heart, right AV valve is the tricuspid valve. Over here on the left side of the heart, the left AV valve or the left atrioventricular valve has two flaps or two cusps. So we call it the bicuspid valve. Bicuspid because there are two cusps. But this one has another name also, the mitral valve. So the bicuspid valve, the mitral valve, the left AV valve, the left atrioventricular valve, all of those are the same thing. Now, we also have valves as we leave the ventricles to go up into either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. On the right side of the heart, between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, here is a semilunar valve. That's what we call those, semilunar valves. And on the left side of the heart, between the left atrium, uh, the left ventricle, I'm sorry, and the aorta, here is another semilunar valve. But we give each of them a more descriptive name. The right side of the heart, that semilunar valve, since it's at the base of the pulmonary trunk, is called the pulmonary semilunar valve, or usually just the pulmonary valve. On the left side of the heart, as we leave the left ventricle to go into the aorta, here is the aortic semilunar valve, or usually just called the aortic valve. One final thing that we will see in a heart is in an infant, the infant is, uh, well, I guess in a fetus, uh, when the baby is still in the womb, that baby is, it doesn't need to breathe. It's getting all of its oxygen from mom across the placenta. So it does not need oxygen from its lungs. It's having it given to it by mom. So there's no real need to 
eject blood from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. Those lungs are not doing anything, so it's kind of just a waste to send blood to the lungs. Some blood does go to the baby's lungs, but nothing really happens there. Instead, inside the wall of the right atrium in a baby that's still in the womb, there is a hole called the foramen ovalis. The foramen ovalis. Blood coming back from the baby's body enters the right atrium. Some of it does go into the right ventricle and off to the lungs, but the majority of it passes through this hole, the foramen ovalis. And on the other side of that hole, blood enters the aorta to go off to the body, to baby's body. But when a baby is born, as soon as that umbilical cord is cut, the baby is no longer receiving oxygen from mom. The baby needs to breathe and get oxygen from its own lungs. Well, when a baby is born, hopefully it's crying, because a crying baby is a breathing baby. If the baby is born and it's not crying, it's common for the doctor to kind of slap its bottom a little bit or give it a little pinch or something to cause it to cry. The crying, again, means that the baby is breathing. As soon as a baby takes its first breath, it causes a chain reaction of events that causes this foramen ovalis to heal up and scar over. But once that happens, you can still see a little bit of a scar there. And that scar is called the fossa ovalis. The fossa ovalis is the remnant, the scar left over from the foramen ovalis. If you ever hear a baby born with a hole in its heart, Usually, not always, but usually what it means is that foramen ovalis did not fully heal over. And there's still a little bit of a hole there. So now we go to heart sounds. And when you listen to your heart, you can hear it beating. And there are actually names given to the sounds that you hear. When you hear a, bar, uh, hear a heart beating, you're hearing the sounds we call lub and dup. Lub, dup, lub, dup, lub, dup is how we kind of refer to heart sounds. But what we're really hearing are the closing of the valves. The first sound, lub, is the closing of the AV valves. The second that we hear is the closing of the semilunar valves. So lub closing AV valves, dup closing semilunar valves. But when you go to the doctor and they're listening to your chest with their stethoscope, well, sometimes they're listening to your lung sounds, but they're also listening for heart sounds and they keep moving the stethoscope around. And that's because based on where they put the stethoscope, they can actually hear specific valves. So here we can see where they place the stethoscope to listen to the aortic valve. Here we can see where they listen for the tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve, and the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. So that's part of why they're moving the stethoscope around so much is to hear each of those valves. But sometimes the valves don't work correctly, and we hear abnormal heart sounds. And abnormal heart sounds, that's what a murmur is. There are different types of murmurs, but a murmur is just the generic term for an abnormal heart sound. The most common types of murmurs come from either something we call incompetent valves or stenotic valves. An incompetent valve is what happens when 
a valve does not close all the way or it closes too far and actually reflects back into the atria. So valves are supposed to close to not allow blood to go back the wrong way and then they open to prevent blood from passing through or to allow blood to pass through. So valves open, blood goes through, valves close, blood cannot go back. Sometimes they don't completely close and backflow of blood occurs. When we listen to this through a stethoscope, an incompetent valve, there's an extra kind of swooshing of blood. That's what that sounds like through a stethoscope, an extra swooshing of blood. The other thing that can happen is called a stenotic valve, and stenotic means hardened or stiffened. And stenotic valves, they can come from a few different things, but one common thing is if the, the valves start to calcify, if there's too much calcium in your body, the valves can start to calcify and stiffen. That means it's harder for them to open, so they don't open all the way. The opening is narrower than it normally would be. This causes the heart to have to work harder, squeeze harder to push the blood through. And through a stethoscope, a stenotic valve sounds kind of like a high-pitched whistling or squealing noise. So incompetent valves allow backflow. Stenotic valves don't open enough, and it's harder for blood to get through. Incompetent valves have an extra swooshing sound. Stenotic valves have a high-pitched squeaking sound. So, thinking cap question. Why do you feel your heartbeat on the left side of your chest? When it's time for someone to stand up and say the pledge or something like that, you commonly will see them put the, their hand on the left side of their chest because that's where you feel your heartbeat, so it's common to think that's where the heart is. But why do you feel your heartbeat on the left side of the chest? We know it's in the middle of the chest, but the left side of the heart has more mass, and that's because the right side of the heart only has to push blood to the lungs, which are right next door. But the left side of the heart has to push blood to the body, so the left side of the heart is much thicker, it has much more mass, it's much stronger, so we feel the heartbeat more on the left side of the chest than on the right side of the chest. All right. So that's the end of this lecture. Make sure to retain that information because we're going to build on it in our next lecture when we look at Path of Blood. All right, take care, and I will talk to you in the next lecture.